What's up, my fellow language nerds? I'm Finkdem, or Aaron from Finkdem Languages. Uh, and today I'm starting my live stream a little bit earlier than usual. Normally I like to start at 10.30 a.m. Uh, cent Central Standard Time. And it's a little bit earlier, but we're going to get started uh, a little bit earlier today because I have things to do this afternoon. Um, anyways, as usual, uh, I'm always interested in hearing from you guys, hearing where you're from and what languages you're learning. So um, I'm a little, I'm kind of excited because I've been working with some other language learners, uh, some other language YouTubers specifically over the past couple of months. And we're preparing uh, a project that we're, we've been collaborating on and we're gonna start releasing that pretty soon, working together. Uh, we're not at the point yet where I am at liberty to, uh, to divulge what that is. Um, but just be on the lookout for something that I'm going to be releasing pretty soon with uh, a couple other language creators. So um, for those of you who are here, let me know in the chat where you're from and what language or languages you're learning. Uh, let me know you're here. Let me know you're alive. So I'm not just talking to myself here. Um, as for myself, uh, for those who don't know, I'm from Wisconsin in the United States. Uh, it's, uh, you know, in the northern part of the United States, it gets very cold here, although right now it's, it's uh, summertime, so it's, it's uh, pretty nice. And I'm learning, I'm currently actively learning Greek, uh, trying to maintain my Thai as much as is feasible here in America. I just learned back, uh, I just came back to America from Thailand a couple months ago. Sergio Silva says, uh, I am using your reading tips to learn English. Excellent. Thanks for joining. Where are you from, Sergio? Or Sergio? I never know what language to pronounce people's names in. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in hearing where you guys are from, what languages you're learning, and, you know, uh, what's going on in your mind as of, uh, as of late. I think I have to adjust some settings here. Welcome to live chat. Remember to guard your privacy. No, that's not anything. All right. I am from Cruz de Almas, state of Bahia, Brazil. Um, yeah, if I knew how to speak Portuguese, I could probably pronounce that in the proper Portuguese way. But anyways, Bahia, Brazil. Thanks. Thanks for joining. What time is it there in Brazil, by the way? I think you guys are maybe one hour ahead of us here in Wisconsin. Um, yeah, anyways, while I wait for responses, as I was saying, I'm actively learning Greek. I'm not pushing myself too hard, but I'm, you know, doing a little bit every day. Uh, I'm trying to maintain my tie. Really, I'm just, essentially what I'm doing is slowing down the erosion of my tie, um, because I'm not actively doing a whole lot. I listen to a Pimsleur audio course, like maybe once a week. <clears throat> and I have one uh, uh, Thai language uh, lesson. We'll call it a session on italki once a week for half an hour. Uh, and then there's also a Thai restaurant in my city that I try to go to and speak Thai to the employees there. But obviously that's not enough to keep my Thai moving forward. But I would like to still stay kind of active using Thai. I've also been maintaining French and Spanish just by like listening to podcasts. I'm reading a novel in Spanish, um, watching movies and stuff, uh, that kind of thing. Hello from Singapore. Saluton el Singapuro. Saluton, amigo. Um, what language is, is English the, the language spoken in Singapore, like natively by most people there? Um, I'm always interested in hearing what people's native language is. Hi, I am from Morocco. Thanks for you uh, for this live. Yeah, thank you, Morocco. I had a, a college professor that was from Morocco, I believe. So let's see, in Morocco, there's a few, a few languages from Morocco, right? Um, I believe French is one of the languages there. Arabic, maybe, and what's the main one, Berber? What are the languages spoken in Morocco? Um, struck my ring. So there it is. 
Okay, Siram says yes and no. So what, is, what other languages are spoken in Singapore then? Interested in hearing. I guess I could just Wikipedia it, but I, I'm more interested in hearing from you guys. Anyways, as I was saying, uh, learning Greek, trying to maintain Thai as much as possible, uh, maintaining French and Spanish, also Esperanto at the same time. Uh, right now we are uh, doing a 30 day record yourself challenge in Esperanto, which I made a video about earlier this week. Hopefully some of you guys uh, see that. All right. Uh, yes, that is right. Excellent. Apparently I'm a, a good rememberer of languages from, from Morocco. For those who are just joining now, let me know where you're from, what languages you're learning and you know, what language is your native language? All right. Hi from Brazil. Hola. Uh, eu quiero aprender a falar português. Um, the official languages are English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil. Wow. I did not know there were so many languages in such a little country. I mean, I, I assume you would be able to, to guess that those languages are spoken. I didn't know that they had, uh, what, four, four official languages? Hi from Turkey. Hello. How do you say hello in Turkish? I always like to greet people in their language. Um, okay, the ethnic languages are primarily spoken at home while English is used for administration and businesses. So English is kind of the lingua franca in, in, in uh, Singapore then, if I understand that correctly. Merhaba. Merhaba. I have no idea how, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, syllable do I put the stress on? Merhaba, merhaba. I'm probably, is there a merhaba? I have no idea. I shouldn't even be trying that. I guess I can look it up. Um, uh, I'm just gonna go to translate, Google translate. English, where's Turkish, Turkish. There we go. Hello. Marhaba. 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 Something like that. Did I say it right? Okay. Um, anyways. Yeah, but that, that's not, uh, as far as uh, languages in Singapore, that sounds about normal. It's kind of like, uh, I believe that's similar to, to India, right? A bunch of official languages, or at least a bunch of spoken languages, depending on where you're from. Um, Hindi being like the uniting lingua franca. And then at home, you speak whatever you speak with your family. And then at school, you speak one language. And then at work, you speak other, speak other languages. Um, that was when education shifted to English in the, in the 80s. OK, gotcha. Hi from Mumbai, India. Ah, oh, hello. We were just talking about India. Uh, Peggy. Hey, what's up, Peggy? Thanks for joining in. L1 equals English learning French. Cool. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's like me. Uh, from America, um, I spent, actually, I didn't spend that long learning French. I guess, well, maybe, yeah, I'm still learning French, right? Like, I haven't arrived at the level I want to be in French. Um, but man, the progression from like A1 in French to like B2 in French went super quick because I already spoke Spanish. Um, I personally speak Tamil natively, but my English is better and I can speak the other two to some extent. Yeah, it's always interesting to me when people can speak their L2 or their second language better than their native language, um, which I guess makes sense under certain circumstances. Like you started speaking one language at home with your parents, but then, you know, all of your school and all of the TV and all, you know, all of your friends speak another language. So you eventually, you know, read books and watch movies in that other language. So eventually that other language becomes stronger. It's interesting though. Um, Sri Ram, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Sri Ram. Uh, I also speak Esperanto, French, and Hindi. Excellent. Uh, okay, I have a question. If you can give advice for me about an English module in university called Applied Linguistics. Do you have any idea about it? Yeah, I majored in Applied Linguistics in my undergrad class. The difference between Applied Linguistics and um, 
like general linguistics or theoretical linguistics. Um, at least in, in my university, there wasn't a big difference. They kind of just like, they were very similar uh, as far as what classes I had to take. Um, in fact, in my last semester of college, I think I was able to make the decision about whether I wanted it to be applied linguistics or theoretical or uh, general linguistics. And I just chose to applied and didn't really put a whole lot of thought into it. Um, but yeah, applied linguistics is, I mean, like what it sounds like, right? You're applying linguistic principles to real life. Whereas theoretical linguistics, you're kind of talking more abstract stuff, theory as to how languages actually exist and how they function and like that kind of thing. And applied linguistics is more like, all right, what are we going to use all this linguistic knowledge for in the real world? So a lot of times like educators uh, will learn about applied linguistics. Like if you're going to teach a foreign language, what are the best theories for teaching languages and stuff like that? Um, I, even though I, 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 uh, I majored in, uh, I ended up getting a degree in applied linguistics. I think I actually am a little bit more interested academically speaking in theoretical linguistics. Like I, I enjoy the theory behind things and a lot of the abstract concepts as opposed to studying how, languages actually get learned, you know, you know, like best practices for teaching languages and stuff like that, which is absolutely uh, important stuff to know about and to teach. But um, I'm a nerd and I really like concepts and, uh, and, and, and hypotheses and, and theories, which of course, you know, you, you have all of that in uh, applied linguistics as well. All right, what is the topic for today's stream? You know, I used to come up with a topic for every different live stream, and now I just kind of show up and I just want to talk to people, which is why I'm always asking people to, you know, leave comments. Where are you from? What language do you speak? That kind of thing, because it gives me something to talk about. I don't come prepared with, with uh, predetermined live stream themes anymore. I just like talking. We can talk about whatever language stuff comes up. Toki. Banana Tree Labs. Um, okay, how do you stay motivated slash productive during this time? I have created myself a very detailed Google Calendar that delineates exactly when I'm gonna be working on YouTube videos, when, like when I have lessons that I teach. I do online lessons, um, like Spanish and English lessons and stuff. Um, one of the lessons that I'm teaching, one is my, well, I only have one lesson where I'm learning per week. Um, I set aside this time for working on videos. I set aside this time for live streaming. Um, I have set aside this time for using link. Every, you know, I try to use link every morning, read a little bit in Spanish. Um, I set aside a little bit of time every morning for using Duolingo. Uh, like I said, I'm kind of dabbling in Greek. I don't know if it'll turn out, end up being a dabble or more of a prolonged dabble. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to learn modern Greek. Um, at least, I don't know what my goals are quite yet. Um, I'm just kind of taking it as it comes and I'm having a good time doing it. So that's all I, I'm really worried about at this point. It, right now it's more of an interest in Greek. It's more of a, um, kind of academic, I'm interested to see how another language works, how another language functions, especially a language that has such a long history um, affecting other languages in Europe. So um, I'm not putting a whole lot of time and effort into it, but I probably do about 10 or 20 minutes of, yeah, probably more like 10 minutes of Duolingo a day, and then 10 or 20 minutes on Link, as well as um, Pimsleur. I just uh, purchased the Pims the first five Pimsleur lessons in Greek. I don't know if I'll stick with that. Um, I love Pimsleur as a method for starting to be able to speak to people. I don't know how much speaking I'm going to do in Greek. It's more of an academic interest, more of an interest in writing and, and listening, uh, re reading and writing. Um, well, mostly reading, honestly. So. I don't know. I, I wanted to try the Pimsleur Greek. I heard it was really good. 
Um, so I'm giving it a shot. Um, anyways, we'll see, you know, we'll see how, how much further I want to take this. All right. If someone wants to get into language learning and they want an easy to build want one easy to build their confidence, would you recommend Toki Pona or Esperanto? Because I can see good arguments for both. Yes, I can see good arguments for both as well. Um, yeah, so the people have made the argument in the past that um, learning, before you start learning to play the tuba, to pick up the recorder, right? Like the little flute, because it's easy and it teaches you some music theory and it teaches you how to practice your instrument every day. And it, and it teaches you a lot of the basic building blocks that you need to start learning a more advanced instrument. Okay, and then once you have spent a little bit of time practicing the recorder, then you'll be able to move on and learn more advanced uh, instruments. Same goes for languages, at least according to the theory, right? You learn, you spend a couple of months learning Tokipona or Esperanto, and you learn a little bit about how languages work. You learn a little bit about how your brain learns languages. You learn a little bit about the most effective strategies for learning languages and how to discipline yourself into having a regular language learning routine. And then after a few months of, of that, then you go into your more advanced language, and but you're better equipped with new strategies for learning the language. And, you, and you, the reason we teach third graders to play the recorder isn't because we think the world will be a better place if we have a bunch of recorder players, right? It, it's to teach them music theory and to teach them some of the building blocks. And then eventually they might even leave the recorder behind and never play it again, but it'll teach them more. And that's the theory with learning Esperanto before any other languages. Now, I think it would be awesome if everyone learned Esperanto and never stopped or took Epona. Um, so is which one is better helping learn other languages? Esperanto is closer to what a real language will be. Okay, um, you have to put in work and time into memorizing words, um, learning grammar and stuff like that. Uh, and it's it's a more realistic. It'll give you more real expect re a more realistic expectation of what other languages will be like. Tokipona only has 120 words and it's very basic. Uh, you can learn all the words in the language in one day if you're if you work really hard or like you know, a week, <laughs> two weeks if you're going to slack. Um, the grammar is very simple in Tokipona. Um, that's more if you like, if you want a real true dabble and you just want to dabble for like a couple of weeks um, into a, another language. Um, yeah, they're, they're both good options. Okay, Peggy says, uh, what would you do if you were coming back to a language after a long time of not practicing? And she says, you do, but I'm not entirely sure what that's in response to. Um, what would I do if I come back to a language after a long time of not practicing? I'm trying to think if I've done that before. Spanish. Yeah, so the only time I've ever really done that was with Spanish. And um, so I learned Spanish in high school and middle school and my first year in college. And then I joined the Marine Corps. And then I didn't study Spanish for like five years while I was in the Marine Corps. And then I moved to El Salvador. Um, I realized after that long period of time that... I had actually maintained a good number, a good bit of the Spanish that I was able to speak, but I forgot a lot of the grammar rules, right? Like, when do you use the subjunctive? I don't know. I, remember, I vaguely remember my teacher telling me there's five times when you use the subjunctive, and here's a mnemonic for remembering when to use the subjunctive and when to use the indicative mood. Uh, I didn't remember the rules, though. You just have to kind of get back into it. Speak, um, speak naturally. Make mistakes. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Uh, get in there and just talk to people. Um, are you going to worry about making grammar mistakes? 
I mean, try to speak with proper grammar, but when you don't know what the right way to say something is, just say it somehow, right? Just use some kind of grammar, whether it's right or not. Um, I think that's more important than speaking perfectly all the time. Okay, because if you're worried about speaking perfectly all the time, you're never gonna speak, and then you're never gonna practice, and then you're never gonna learn the language. Um, unless your only goal is to read, which is a perfectly legitimate goal. Um, hello from India. Hello, Nawal. Um, does your computer programming figure into your linguistic study? No. I've done a little bit of computer programming, mostly for fun. I learned Python a few years ago, and I would just make like video games and stuff. Uh, but it was just because it was fun. How much do you charge for Spanish lessons? Um, I charge $28 an hour for Spanish lessons or $15 for half an hour. I need you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, greetings from Indonesia. Would you mind explaining more about the difference between applied linguistics and linguistics? Are there any differences? Thank you. Uh, so applied linguistics is a type of linguistics. Um, specifically, applied linguistics talks about how we can apply linguistics to like real world settings, right? So like um, how, what are the best methods for teaching language in a classroom, stuff like that. Um, or probably for like uh, best ways for teaching speech sounds to people with disabilities and things like that. Um, it's less theoretical and it has less to do with like, what is the structure of the language? How can we determine uh, what, um, you know, like what the final tactics of Turkish are? Um, you know, it has to do with like solving problems in that people encounter in real life, as opposed to just learning more like academic knowledge about a given language or about human language or universal grammar or something like that. Uh, greeting. Okay. Uh, do you know much about the differences between languages in India? No. No, I do not. I know some of the languages from India come from the Indo-European branch, like Hindi uh, and Sanskrit. Um, and then other languages in India come from, I want to say like the Dravidian branch or something like that. So they're totally unrelated to each other. Um, as far as we can tell, some linguists have tried to go back and see how languages are related way, way back, even to the point where some language, some linguists claim they have, um, they have discovered like the original language that, um, that humanity used to speak. Um, I think that's a little bit far-fetched. Um, but essentially what these, what, um, what they do is, um, what linguists do when they're trying to recreate dead languages, um, like pro, for example, Proto-European, which is not spoken by anyone. We don't have any written record of this language. Um, we don't have, you know, like, the, so it, it would be reasonable for someone to say, well, how do we know that this language even ever existed? What, like, what is this Proto-Indo-European that you're talking about? Um, we don't have any record of it. We don't have anyone that speaks it. There is no, we don't have any written version of this language. There's nothing, there's literally nothing left of the language. How, how do you know it even existed? The reason we know that Proto-Indo-European existed is because we have all of its descendants, right? We have Greek, we have Albanian, we have Russian, we have Lithuanian, we have uh, Sanskrit, we have Latin, we have English, um, you know, we have all these languages that were descend, we can tell they were descended from Proto-Indo-European. And how can we tell that? Um, when you compare all of these languages, you see how they're similar, 
and you see how they differ. Okay, so for example, in English we have the number two, and in Spanish we have dos, in French we have du, in uh, German we have du. Is it du? I don't know. I don't speak German. Um, and what you see is that all of these languages start off. Uh, the, the the word for two in all of these languages starts with the, the letter D or something similar to the letter D. Okay, zwe. In German, it's zwe. All right, I was way off. Um, but that's still an alveolar. You, um, it, still, it still has similarities to, um, to the, to the uh, alveolar sounds D and, and T. Oh, du means you in German, right? Oh, we can go that route too, okay? So in, in Spanish, we have tu, right? As in you, tu, and in German, it's du, okay? And you can see similarities between them. And when you look at all of the languages um, in this family and see how, oh, okay. Z sounds like TS in German, so you're not wrong. Gotcha. All right, so the point still stands. Um, when you look at the similarities between all of these languages and you see how a lot of them are similar, and then one or two of them might be a little bit different in one way, um, but then you, 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 um, you, you find, you know, uh, I don't know how to really explain this. Like, but you see that they, they all start with, um, with a similar letter. Okay, except for one or two other languages. Well, then you'll say these one or two other languages, uh, something funny happens to them and they changed, right? But most of these other languages stayed relatively the same. Um, and then you say, but that's just the first letter in the word two. Let's look at the ending of the word two, okay? And then in English, we have um, uh, ou in the end of the word two, and in French we have u uh, at the end of the word uh, uh, de, and in in uh, German we have zwe or zwe. I don't know how to say that. Se, zwe. So they all end in vowels, and then in Spanish you have dos, and it ends in an s. Well, you can say like something funny happened in Spanish, and they added an s onto the end of of the number two. So Spanish in that case is the weird one that sticks out. Um, and so you, you, you do this to all kinds of different words, a bunch of different words, um, and you can trace it all the way back to, well, we think the original word to in the Proto-Indo-European language would have been something like the word do, or I don't know. I don't know what it is actually. Let me, actually now I'm curious. I'm going to look up a list of Proto-Indo-European words. Let's see if we have any numbers from Proto-Indo-European. Wool. Okay, yeah. So apparently, according to Wikipedia, the um, Indo-European word for two would have been something along the lines of duo. And um, the word for three would have been treyes or something like that, which... You can see, like, you can see how treyes is kind of related to three, and it's kind of related to tres in Spanish, right? Or trois in, in French. Um, you know, and then they compare it to Lithuanian and Albanian and Sanskrit. And, um, and, and after they compare it to all these words, uh, that you, you find similarities, uh, and then you'll find some outliers that are not similar, but you just say, well, those ones probably changed. We have all these other ones that are so similar. There's got to be something, uh, there's got to be something there. So for example, the word um, for uh, mother is meter, and the word for father is pter, Something like that. I don't know how to pronounce these words. I don't think anyone knows how to pronounce them. Um, but, you know, that sounds a lot like mater, right? Is that Latin? Where we get maternity, okay? And pater, 
um, where we get the word padre or père or um, paternity. Um, and you can even see a, a similarity between father and pater, right? Um, you, we would just say that in English, for whatever reason, the, in the initial P in Proto-Indo-European turned into an F sound. Um, it was actually one of the Grimm brothers from the, brother, the Brothers Grimm. It was one of the Grimm brothers who, who discovered that, actually. Um, a lot of Proto-Indo-European words that started with a P transformed into Germanic words that start with an F, interestingly enough. I don't know how I got onto that subject. But anyways, after you trace it back to Proto-Indo-European, and you trace back Indian languages to like Dravidian, and you, tra tra you um, trace uh, other languages back to uh, Sino, no, yeah, Sino, Sinitic languages, like the Chinese languages, and then you trace um, Amharic and Arabic and, and Hebrew back to the same Semitic language, like Proto-Semitic or something, Proto-Afro-Asiatic. Then you have all of these proto-languages that we don't have anymore, that don't exist and aren't written, but we can reconstruct them. And then what you say is, do all of these proto-languages have similarities that we can trace back even further? And people have done that. Um, there's also what they call um, Amerind, which is like someone did work to try to reconstruct all of all of the uh, the American Indian or the Native American or First American um, the languages that existed before Europeans came over, um, and they think that they've recreated uh, what language would have come over over the Bering Strait into the Americas. the The research on that is kind of debatable, um, or the the conclusions that they've come to. So we don't really know for sure. Um, but there's a lot of really good work that's been done on Proto-Indo-European. Um, and some people think they can trace back these proto-languages even further back in history to what language was originally spoken by humans. Um, I think that's a little bit over ambitious, like you're kind of grasping at straws when you're trying to go back 100,000 years, what language was spoken back then. Um, but it's interesting. And who knows? You know, who knows? Um. Maybe there's something to it. I would be surprised if uh, it's impossible to to recreate nothing uh, past you know ten or fifteen thousand years ago. Uh, but who knows? I'm not I'm not educated enough in that area uh, to to really make my own uh, predictions. All right, uh, do you have any advice on how to deal with perfectionism in language learning? Yeah, I've done this thing that I've, call, I've called um, uh, comfort zone challenges, where you go out and you intentionally do things that make you uncomfortable. Like one of the things that I would do is uh, like walk around with my zipper down, right? That's something that we all do accidentally on occasion. Um, and it's really embarrassing, but if you do it on purpose and you just get used to being embarrassed, you get used to being uncomfortable and get used to people thinking you're a weirdo, <laughs> um, it starts to lose its sting. And the same thing happens with language learning. If you just go out and just start talking and you tell yourself, all right, for five minutes, I'm going to speak my target language nonstop to this native speaker without worrying if I'm speaking correctly. I'm just gonna make a fool of myself and I'm gonna stop worrying about being perfect. Um, you start to realize that people don't care if you make a few grammar mistakes in their language. Um, you just need to speak, okay? And they'll be happy to help you most of the time. Um, and yeah, and, and it's not as scary as you think. And the more you do it, the more you'll get comfortable uh, making mistakes or not knowing whether you're speaking correctly, right? Um, we, we all know some uh, uh, someone from a foreign country who is just totally confident speaking English, even though they speak very poorly or, you know, whatever language 
whatever language you learn, right? Like someone who's lived in the country for, um, they've been here for 30 years and they've never really mastered English and it's hard to understand, but they'll just go on talking and talking and talking and talking. Um, and, you know, and you just, you develop a sense of uh, confidence when you're speaking your target language. Um, when you stop worrying about, oh man, did I conjugate my verb correctly? Did I use the subjunctive correctly? Was that the right tone? Did I say something wrong? You just talk. You just get comfortable talking. And, and you know you're making mistakes and you say, I don't care. I'm happy to make mistakes. Does the study of linguistics allow us to track human migration? Yeah, to some extent, yeah. Um, because it's really interesting, actually. So in Proto-European, there was a word for horse, but there was no word for palm tree, supposedly, right? And we know that because we can see how the word horse slowly changed as it went in different directions in different languages. So we say there must have been a word for horse in that language, in Proto-Indo-European. But the word for palm tree comes from all kinds of different languages. Like we took the word for palm tree from Arabic or something, right? Um, what that tells us is that the people who originally spoke Proto-Indo-European had no word for palm tree. And then once they came, you know, once their descendants migrated to areas with palm trees, either they invented their own word for palm tree or they took it from some other language. Okay, which we can then extrapolate the people who spoke Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European, didn't live in an area that had palm trees. Um, and I think, I'm going to look this up because I don't want to say this wrong. I believe they, uh, um, you know, once they've done uh, an analysis on, on, uh, oops. And the language, I believe they can trace back the area where um, Indo Proto Indo European was spoken. They can trace it back to Ukraine or Turkey, somewhere in that area. Um, Proto Indo European language is a linguistic reconstruction of the ancient common ancestor of Indo European languages. Um, I'm looking at a map here. The Danube Valley. Oh, Yamna culture. I don't know where that is. Um, it looks like it's above the Black Sea. It's where uh, the uh, Proto-Indo-European language would have originally been spoken. And then it started to kind of slowly expand out into like into Russia and down into like Greece, um, then towards like Iran and down into India and further into Europe. Yes, so in other words, you can read, uh, linguistics can tell us a little bit about how language, how, you know, how people spread um, and how they migrated in the distant past. Okay, you mentioned one of the Grimm's brothers. Isn't Grimm's law a thing? I've heard of it somewhere, I think. Yes, sorry, I'm, I'm way backed up now. Yeah, the Grimm's brothers were the people that collected fairy tales and wrote them down. Um, Grimm's law is a thing. Um, I'm gonna look this up really quick. And that's specifically what I was talking about. Grimm's Law, also known as the First Germanic Sound Shift, is a set of statements first systematically put forward by Jacob Grimm from the Brothers Grimm. Um, okay, describing the Proto Indo European stop consonants as they developed to Proto Germanic, which is the common ancestor of um, English, Icelandic, German, Dutch, Norwegian. Um, in the first millennium BC. It established a set of regular correspondence, correspondences between early Germanic stops, uh, meaning like T, D, P, B, K, G sounds, fricatives and stop consonants. Um, so essentially what this is saying is that, um, 
certain sounds that were originally in Proto Europe, Indo European, we can trace how they changed from like an F sound in or from a P sound into an F sound in English and in German. Okay, I watched your video and I love it, all of them. Thank you, I'm from Saudi Arabia. Hello, Mohammed, thanks for joining. Welcome from America. Uh, here we have Abdullah. I'm an English learner. I want to improve my writing skills. Please give us advice. I'm learning three languages at once. English in the morning, French in the afternoon, and Spanish in the evening. I give each language three or four hours. Do you think I can be a B2 Spanish and French in one year? All right. If you're learning three languages at once, and you give each one three or four hours, so you're saying you practice languages for like 12 hours a day? Um, if you're practicing your languages for 12 hours a day, you could potentially learn languages very quickly. Um, but that sounds like a recipe for burning yourself out and eventually practicing your languages for zero hours a day, um, especially if you're learning three languages all at the same time. I've heard debates on whether learning two languages at once is good or, or at least doable. I think the consensus is that you can do it. You can learn two languages at once. Three is going to be really pushing it. Okay, I only stick with one. Okay, I, I will maintain other languages while trying to learn one, but I put all my focus on one language that I want to learn. Um, that's just my thing. I like your body language. You are very intelligent. Thank you. And then Adel Wab says, you seem sort of gay. Well, I'm not gay. Sorry to disappoint. Um, all right. I am Nawal. Hello. Thanks for joining. Anyways, well, now I've reached the end of, um, reached the end of our comments. And what time is it? 10.30. So um, I guess I'll take, I'll give like five more minutes if anyone else has any other questions. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to get going here and, and just very briefly. Hello, Rasmus. Man, Rasmus, I don't know what it is. You always end up uh, catching the live streams right at the end. But thanks for joining anyways. I appreciate you coming in for a little bit. Um, I'm capable of studying 13 hours every day. I wake up at 5 a.m. and I'm finished at 22 p.m. All right, that is a lot. That's a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to dedicate your whole, like, if you, I mean, how do you work? What do you do? I mean, it is uh, practicing language like part of your job? If so, then excellent. Um, I definitely don't have enough time in my day to practice that long. Uh, so your advice to learn two languages maximum. Uh, I don't want to prescribe to you a set of rules that you have to follow in order to learn a language. What I want to do is at least give people guidelines for the best way that they can maximize their learning and set realistic goals for themselves. And honestly, learning three languages a day for 12 hours a day does not sound realistic to me unless you have some kind of, um, yeah, you have to have some kind of uh, realistic, uh, there just must be some kind of really extreme circumstances that you're in that would allow you to, to do that, um, which most of us will never be in. Um, two languages is doable. I don't want to say three is not doable, but it also depends what your goals are. Okay. If you just are interested in languages and you want to learn a little bit about every language, then yeah. Yeah. Sure, fine. Um, 
you know, you, uh, especially if they're very different languages rather than languages that are very similar and you're going to mix them up a lot. If your goal is to reach a B1 level or a B2 level, do two languages at a time, maximum, or one. You know, it'll take three times as long because you're going to have to dedicate, you know, three different periods of your life to learning those languages, but it'll actually take shorter because you'll accomplish your goal then, as opposed to trying to learn three languages at once, and then you have to find time every day to practice all three of them. It's going to be tough, man. That sounds like a losing battle to me. Uh, do you stream a specific time every Friday? Okay, generally... Most Fridays, I start at 10.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. This week, I started about 45 minutes early. So, yeah, it would be around this time right now, whatever time it is right now. Um, that's when I would normally start streaming on a Friday. Uh, this week was just a little exception because I have plans this afternoon. Where are you from? I am from uh, Wisconsin in the United States. Okay, have you considered learning classical languages like Latin or Sanskrit? Uh, Greek, ancient Greek, I've considered learning. Right now I'm learning modern Greek. Uh, I would still be interested in learning Attic Greek or Koine Greek. Um, and maybe my little bit of dabbling in modern Greek will help with that. I would hope. <laughs> Um, are you working on any other projects right now? I'm not sure what you mean by projects. I am working on something with a couple other language YouTubers right now. Um, I can't talk about what it is, but I've, I've been working with two other um, people that you might know from here on YouTube um, for several months, and we're preparing a project that we're going to release hopefully within the next month or two. So uh, keep a lookout for that. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. All three of us are pretty excited about it. I just can't give you too many details right now because it's not really my project. We're, it's a collaborative thing that we're working on together. We are going to create a new, I don't know if they want me to tell this or not, but I'm just going to announce it now. We're, the three of us together are creating a new YouTube channel. And the three of us will still continue to work on our own channels, but um, there will be a, a fourth channel that the three of us share together. <laughs> Okay, uh, do you think learning languages from the same family at the same time is a good idea? Uh, it can be tough. Uh, I can't speak specifically about every scenario, but like <clears throat> learning Portuguese and Spanish at the same time is gonna be hard because so many of the words are similar and it might they might complement each other in the sense that um, you know, when you do make mistakes by using the wrong word from the other language, people will usually understand, like, if you say, yo quiero aprender falar portugués, um, people will understand what you're saying, or, uh, you know, it, Spanish and Portuguese are close enough together that when you make a mistake and use the wrong word from the other language, uh, it probably won't be detrimental to you. Mm, but if you're trying to really learn the language well, uh, it probably will be harder. Not to say it can't be done. Um, and I don't really have a whole lot of experience with that other than French. I first learned Spanish and then I learned French. And a big part of my French at the beginning was uh, saying Spanish words with French accents. Um, that was, yeah, that was... Um, uh, so it was a big help. It was a big help learning languages that were closely related together. Okay. Um, when is the right time to tell a dog when they are adopted? Never. You never tell your dog that he was adopted. You let him live his life as a lie for his whole life. Uh, and then you reveal it to him at the last minute when he's on his deathbed just to ruin his last moments. Okay. <laughs> um, Rasmus A., for example, Dutch and German, Danish or Norwegian. Yeah, I, I can't speak too much about those languages because I have very little experience with them. 
but you know, I've already said what I have to say about that. Uh, how many words do I need? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know how many words you need. Uh, what do you want to say? What, you know, do you just want to have a basic conversation? Do you want to just be able to order your food? Do you just want to be able to tell a taxi driver where to take you? Um, you don't need too many words for that. Do you want to discuss politics and religion? Uh, you need a lot of words for that. And the more words you can acquire, the better. But it's not about once you reach a certain number of words, you've arrived. Because words are important, but you need to practice using your words. Sound like I'm talking to a three-year-old. Use your words. Practice your words. Okay. Um, my aim is to be fluent in English and B1 or B2 in Spanish and French. Did I write Friday instead of Friday in the title? Yes, I did. <laughs> I'm going to change that real quick. Well, no, I can't edit it right now. Oh, well. So I guess today is my Friday live stream. Uh, Quel âge as-tu? J'ai 30 ans. According to sequence, blank sequence, first of all, a simple structure having a subject group. Salute Don Al Chiwi and Evil Dia Dia Dio. I'm not sure what that meant. Um, okay, in all serious though, I wish your channel to have a million subscribers. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, have you ever tried Bluebird languages? It seems like Pimsleur, but with unthinkable, unbelievable amount of content. No, I've never heard of it, actually. Bluebird languages? Bluebirdlanguages.com. 163 languages free in your mother tongue. Interesting. I'll check that out. Thanks for sharing that, Rasmus. Friday is old English. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, well, oh, I think he's talking about how many words to be fluent. <sighs> yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I honestly don't have any answer for you. How many words do you need to be fluent? Um, I don't know. I just, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer the question because I don't know the answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, but anyways, thanks to everyone who is here. Um, I appreciate your questions. I apologize if I can't answer them. Um, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll be here again next week. Maybe I'll try to look up the questions, the answer, the questions that I, I didn't uh, read about, um, that I didn't know the answer to. And I'll see you guys next week. Oh, Seabolt talked in an interview with the founder of Bluebird. Um, interesting. I'll have to look that up. Seabolt is a good friend of mine. Um, and in fact, if you're, if you like Seabolt, um, I have a video coming up this Monday where I interviewed John Seabolt, funnily enough. Um, so that'll be coming up. It's about a 45 minute interview. Anyways, thank you all for who have watched and joined and participated and commented. I love interacting with you guys, and uh, I'll be here next week, most likely at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time, which is like uh, Greenwich, England time, minus six, I believe. See you then. Bye-bye.